That's it. See, life's becoming so cheap, and it ties in again with the euthanasia clinics they want to open in Britain. Oh, you've had enough come in here, and we'll dispose of you very cheaply too. And uh, that kind of thing is going on, on across the world. This is all coordinated together. Life is cheap. We are a renewable resource. Even though most folk are becoming infertile, sterile actually, at an early age, because we've been poisoned and inoculated to make it so, it's still not fast enough. To, because these guys have got timetables. They want a nice pristine planet by the year 2050 so they can go out with their hounds, you know, and their horses and chase the foxes uh, without seeing peasants all over the place and rags. And you think I'm kidding. You think I'm kidding. Another way, too, the big boys take it over is by taking over, making laws, international laws, of course, because they create the international groups like the G20 and G8, all the, all the Gs, all the Gs are inside the masonry, you know. And it says that foreigners have a stake in 11% of the farmland. It sounds, well, it's only 11%. And this is in Australia, which is foreign investors have a stake in more than 10% of the nation's farmland and 9% of valuable agricultural water entitlements. So the foreigners own your water and now they're taking over your land. Amid a debate over selling the farm, the Bureau of Statistics said yesterday 45 million hectares, 11% of Australia's farming land, was at least partly foreign-owned. That's quite some 45 million hectares. And the first official figures in the topic more than 25 years was also revealed that 1,169 gigalitres of water entitlements were owned by businesses with a foreign interest. Well, just wait until they own it all, because you see, that's the world they've decided to bring in. They don't want small farms. They've, they've demolished the U.S. and Canada with small farms by harassing them with, with fees and, and legalities and inspectors. Because only the big agribusinesses, the five biggies, must be left to dominate the world, which they're pretty well done. There's massive tracts of Australia, great farm, and New Zealand going up too for, for sale. Incredible old, old farms, big ones, dairy producers, a whole lot, because it's, there, there's so many penalties, penalties coming on them at home. But of course, the, the foreign ownerships will be, they'll be exempt from these particular things. People have gone on and on about Wi-Fi and what Wi-Fi does. There's no doubt about it. A microwave is not good for the body or the brain or anything else for that matter. It doesn't, it shouldn't be in, in society, in the air and the, the levels that it is. But, um, it's interesting too. They put up, they used to have satellite towers in a lot of schools and they took down the satellites and put up these, these new Wi-Fi, huge, big, tall antennas. And uh, they would get their signal, I guess, from the big cell phone towers that are all over the place. And then they started getting children sick in schools. Well, the ordinary folk who pay their taxes and have no option but to send their children to school, uh, without, you know, not the rich schools, uh, they, they'll continue with them getting sick and all. Actually, they get a bit dumb, I think, too. I think you get dumb around Wi-Fi. But the private schools can do something about it. A private school in Ontario has cut its wireless internet network over concerns that technology causes health issues in students. Petty is Pretty River Academy in Collingwood, Ontario, private school with 150 students attending kindergarten to grade 12 as the first Ontario school to remove Wi-Fi from the campus. Actually, Europe, uh, the European Union, actually, I think, made a decision, too, to start removing them from all schools. The school's old Wi-Fi system was taken out over the summer and replaced with Ethernet connections ahead of the first day of the school year. It made the World Health Organization said radio frequency radiation from Wi-Fi and cell phones Pose a similar threat to DDT. I like how they, it's like weighing carbon, you know, it's just out of their imagination. It's far worse than DDT. And then lead and car exhaust. Principal's Roberta Murray Hirsch says the new hardwired internet system is actually faster than the previous system and gives teachers control over when students can go online. Murray Hirsch said they did not receive any complaints from students or parents about health concerns, but decided to take the precautions anyway. Uh, we'd like to be proactive. I like this word. Every, if you work for a government in any capacity, right down teacher level, you've got to be proactive, you know. And obviously safety is always a concern, she said. The debate over wireless internet in Ontario schools grew heated last summer when a group of elementary school teachers attempted to have the technology banned from classrooms in the Niagara region. The Ontario Teachers of Federation of Ontario voted in 2010 to keep wireless internet. In August, they vote, the group voted to establish a committee for studying Wi-Fi in classrooms. A group called the Safe Schools Committee has also con- continued to push for a ban. As I say, Europe's already come out with it because they've admitted in school. It's okay to doze the, the children, or it's not okay, but adults can get dozed because they're, 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 they're making sure that it's all over the darn country, wherever you go.
wherever you go. There's many wep- types of weapons, you know, and most folk, if you like a thing, it's hard to describe it as a weapon, isn't it? And what's so handy, it's so, it's so darned handy, couldn't live without it as it kills you, you know. And as things get more and more ridiculous uh, with the police state, basically, I mentioned yesterday that the biggest growth in this in the U.S. is government. And, of course, this homeland security gets more and more myriads of bureaucracies and new types of uh, layers of cops and special, special cops and special, special, special cops and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, you're going to see more and more ridiculous things happening in society. Once you have layers and layers of special, 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 special cops, then you've got to find new things for them to do. It's like this, the ordinary cops used to have to just turn them out on the, on the streets to bring in money for the government by ticketing folk. That's what you do with them. Find something. Anyway, they're now going after the Amish for, for their horse-drawn carts. So Amish were jailed for over uh, horse-drawn carts. It says, an Amish family in Pennsylvania, two pen, uh, it says, uh, nine Amish men were in the U.S. who refused to display an orange reflective triangle in their horse-drawn buggies, have been ordered to jail for not paying court-imposed fines. The men belong to an ultra-conservative old order, Schwartz and Truber Amish sect in western Kentucky, they object to the triangles because the bright color violates their modesty code. Maybe if you put one of these map signs on it, they'll let you go. The Courier Journal reports that the men say paying the fines would amount to complying with a law they believe violates their religious strictures. Well, I've got to tell you, folks, um, when Janet Rio, Janet Rio, that strange creature, uh, was in the U.S. government, she also mentioned, too, along with the, the, the woman who was the uh, that that's something general they have for health in the U.S. She wanted, she wanted the black woman. She had to leave because she wanted children to have mass masturbation in the classroom <laughs> from the United Nations. No kidding. Yeah, that was the time of Janet Rio. Uh, I'm sure she wouldn't object to it either. And uh, and that's when they brought down the Waco Church. That was a big signal. That these, you understand? You're looking at ritual here. You're looking at incredible ritual going on when you, this kind of thing has happened, uh, and they go against a church. Uh, with bogus charges and really no previous conversations with them. Just didn't it, in come the SWAT teams. They thought it'd be a fast deal, just kill them all. And it took a, a while to drawn out drama to kill them all and kill them all. They eventually did. And at the end, you saw the BATF guys, the SWAT teams, literally bowing to the flames. Did you ever remember that? Bowing to the flames. What, what religion do you think that belongs to? Eh? And what did the locals do around there in Waco? Uh, the, the townspeople in the cities, they put up signs to advertise it was a great thing that they were doing this, yada, 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 and come to their city and have a great time and all that kind of stuff as they burn down ordinary folk. That was a sign, a sign that religion now is gone, at least that religion is gone. Never mind the time before they went for Randy Weaver and then they brought snipers out, told in advance to kill his wife, which they did. She was holding the baby and they shot her. And then they promoted the guy eventually who actually sniped and killed her. That's the system you're in. If you think you want to keep that system, good luck to you. But I don't want to be around you, <laughs> personally. I'll put up a, a site tonight, too. It's called, all these links I'll put up at cuttingthroughmedics.com. It's called Top 10 Truly Bizarre Taxes. Quite interesting, down through the ages. There's a lot more, of course, because through playing cards and how that came in uh, centuries ago, you had, to, you had to actually pay the king a tax to buy playing cards, and the candy tax, and, and um, the jock tax, it was called as well, uh, for, for people who visited the city and made money while they were there. And cowardice tax, that came in as well, and, uh, during one of the king's times, and, and, and Jared, Henry the first, I think it was. And then there was a hat tax, and the window tax. I mentioned the window tax before. I used to think it was James I, but it wasn't. It was King William uh, of Orange, basically, the guy who came in to bring in the bankers with them uh, into Britain from Holland. And that's literally the ones that are still running the show today. Uh, that's where the Orange Lodge comes from, one of the top uh, Masonic lodges. And the bear tax. There was even a bear tax. That's that quite inventive, isn't it? Henry VIII, I think, brought that, brought that in even though he had a beard himself. And it's quite uh, comical in a sense. It shows you that the, the, to get money, you can choose anything you want. You could have ear tax for waxy ears or, you know, that kind of thing, or bald taxes or whatever, flat feet maybe. 
that there's no end to ingenuity to justify theft, you see. None at all. And the supercomputer that predicts revolution. See, the big boys are always pushing through things through the special computers. And feeding a supercomputer with new stories could help predict major world events, according to U.S. research. I'm sure they've had this thing for many, many years. And they feed in all the data around the world. And the computer spouts out if there's too much of uh, oppression in a, in a country through taxes or whatever, the people might rebel. And that's awfully important to folk today who run, run the world, is to see who's going to rebel next. Because they've got to make sure that they're way ahead of it and, and either nip it in the bud or make sure if they do rebel, they can use it as an opportunity for something else they've got up their sleeves. Back with more after this break. Hi folks, we're back. This is Cutting Through the Matrix. And just to make sure, it was Janet Reno uh, I was talking about earlier on. That's her name, this strange creature that works alongside Bill Clinton. Now I'll try and get a caller, and that was Kyle from Pennsylvania. Hanging on to you there, Kyle. Yes, sir. How are you doing tonight? Not too bad at all. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, I just got done reading uh, Alistair Crowley's The Book of the Law yeah. and uh, the Goetia in the original, I guess it was the Latin form. Mm-hmm. Um, now, I, I don't know if the stuff is real or not, but, uh, you know, do they, do they think it's real? And when you were talking earlier about, you know, the pedophiles with, you know, babies and children and stuff, is that, you know, a form of, you know, sex magic and, and stuff like Oh, yeah. That? Alistair Crowley was definitely into, into the sex magic side of things and... Uh, so are his followers as well. He wrote quite a few books about it too. He also said too that the greatest sacrifice you could give for for power was uh, the killing of your firstborn child. And when he was over in a little place in Italy um, with his with his converts, you might say, or what you want to call them, um, his son died actually. And, it's, and it was a great place for it to happen. You pay any cop, they won't come near you. They'll just let you go. So anyway, there was a big stink about that. And wonder if they actually did it. Um, but he, he was psychopathic in nature and uh, charismatic again for the for the followers, and he was the one who started off going off to South America to get stoned, uh, taking the drugs and finding your power animal that became a rage through all the um, the, the Masonic uh, propaganda that they give out since even right up to this day. There's guys out there still saying go off to Latin America and find your power animal by drinking this this juice, you know. So he was into all of that stuff, but they do believe. That they, they, or he did. He certainly believed in, in sexual magic, and um, he also was into channeling the demons, as he called it. You know, uh, the, uh, they called him what the other monster of Loch Ness. When he oh yeah, he 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 actually bought over a house in, Lo- in Loch Ness and um, painted it up with pentangles and all the different symbols around the walls and floors. And Jimmy Page bought that over, and and he lived there for a while, but. Um, Crowley uh, definitely was, was psychopathic in nature. A lot of drugs he was on. He died uh, borrowing money, in fact, for, for his hits of heroin and so on. Um, but uh, he, it's up, he was up there with uh, a lot of the elite are interested in this stuff, an awful lot of the elite. Yeah, and, that's what I was reading. That, like, yeah. and, I, I, and he also, his, his, his main channeler, I think he called Layla, was her nickname. Uh, there's another name for her, but she was called Layla. And uh, that Eric Clapton put that in one of his songs too, Leela, you know. And the Beatles, they put him on the cover of Sgt. Pepper. And yeah. um, even like uh, Led Zeppelin, they yeah. really, they really, really, you know, respected Alistair Crowley and tried to follow him. And so yes. I assume that at some level, I haven't quite gotten there yet, but I assume at some level it's all connects up to, you know, like Bohemian Grove and all that jazz too. Oh yeah, there's, there's organizations that even above the, the Bohemian Grove, which are more exclusive, in fact. Um, uh, and you understand, all those that you see Bohemian Grove technically are still classed as workers for the system. Uh, they're in the public limelight. They have to travel around the world, give talks or handle committees or be CEOs. There's a group at the top which don't do that work. Uh, and they, they're much higher, they're much older uh, and in-depth religion than, than this. Yeah. Thanks again, Al. Keep up all the good work, man. Uh, thanks for calling. And it's a very good documentary about Crowley, too. I'll try and find it sometime, put it up on the site. 
Remember, help support me. Keep this going if you like it. And um, hopefully we can crawl along for maybe another few weeks. From Hamish Masyad, Ontario, Canada, it's good night to me. Your God or your gods go with you.